That was just uh, by chance because of the, the topics and the organization over the week. Uh, so Andre and uh, Evgeny from uh, Yandex are going to share about browser-based uh, malware. We had presentations on this topic, but uh, this is going to be uh, interesting. So you, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. My name is Andrei Kovalev. As Eric said, this is my colleague uh, Evgeny Sidorov. Uh, we work both at uh, Yandex security team. I focus in uh, Yandex browser security and Evgeny is engaged in uh, web application security and mobile application security. We had a, uh, we had a talk at BotConf 2014 and now we are going to present our new research uh, about browser-based power. Uh, during this presentation, we will dwell on uh, the man in the browser uh, technique, uh, which is correlated with browser-based malware. We also discuss some next generation features uh, which used by modern man in the browser malware. Uh, we also discuss some in the wild examples, the most interesting examples. Uh, and uh, at the end, we of course will share our experience and knowledge about the detection and prevention techniques for such kind of malware. So, let's go to the Man in the bl Browser basics. Uh, you all probably know uh, this attack vector. It's well known, actually. Uh, so, uh, during this attack, the attacker, have, uh, uh, the attacker has to infect uh, the victim's computer by uh, malware. Uh, which uh, has to inject the special malicious code to the browser process. Uh, usually this code uh, breaks the normal interaction between browser rendered page and network connection and uh, gets the opportunity to inject additional JavaScripts to the rendered page. So these JavaScripts uh, have opportunities to steal credentials user, uh, which is in, which a user uh, uh, entered in this page, and uh, dump a web page uh, or hijack content on the page, and so on. This very actual attack for internet banking systems, mail providers, social networks, and so on. Uh, this story uh, started long, long ago. Uh, for the first Man in the Browser realizations, uh, the browser helper objects for Internet Explorer uh, were used. And uh, the first realization uh, was based on just a request response hijacking for the browser. But uh, modern classic Man in the Browser uh, examples just uh, do uh, the JavaScript injection for being very reliable and good. Uh, very good explanation uh, of this technique was at BotConf 2013. Guys from GData uh, made great presentation about classic man and the browser technique. You can fi find it in the link. So, but we want to discuss some difficulties uh, that attacker may, uh, that means the attacker when he want to use the man in the browser uh, technique nowadays. First of all, uh, the classic man in the browser technique uh, is based on hooks, some patches for the browser process. Uh, nowadays, these hooks are very hard to support because every update of browser can, broke, uh, can, can break uh, these hooks. Also, nowadays there are several security technologies like App Container, for example, in Windows 10, that uh, which also may uh, which also makes special hardwarings for code injection. Uh, and of course, such technique. Uh, uh, produces uh, pr produces a lot of indicator uh, indicator of compromise. So the attacker have to infect the system by malware. This malware must uh, inject uh, some code. Uh, this malware uh, 
of course, sh should uh, should get after run on the system and so on. And all these indicator of compromise that are well known for antivirus vendors and antivirus vendors know how to detect uh, these classical techniques. But in our research, we want to introduce some next generation features of modern man in the browser, malware and adware. So for uh, getting the same effect uh, nowadays, uh, the attacker don't, uh, doesn't have to create the malicious code injection in browser during the hooks, uh, using the hooks. Uh, he can just uh, use the browser extensions for the same effects. He also uh, uh, can use uh, Windows filtering platform proxies, uh, which is to more more difficult than extensions. And also, there are several uh, remote proxy servers, so VPN providers, uh, which are often used by users for bypassing national. Uh, based firewall, for example, in Russia, there is special fire, uh, there is special mechanism provided by Roskomnadzor. <laughs> A lot of users want to bypass it and uh, use such kind of services. And all these services could uh, provide uh, web injections. So, in our research, uh, we are focusing uh, browser extensions because they are very reliable. Uh, they have less indicator of compromise than Windows fil filtering platform drivers. And uh, they are very interesting for us. So let's go uh, to in the wild examples. Uh, we found a lot, so, but uh, we will describe it only two. And the first one is the echo malware, and we called it just Facebook backdoor. So what is the echo malware? Uh, actually, uh, it is extension, uh, Chromium extension, uh, the, uh, which spreads uh, without any dropper through and for Facebook. Uh, well, it distributed by inline installations, and interesting that it works like classical botnet. He has a uh, own so-called command and control server, which provides the main uh, malicious functionality. The main purpose of this backdoor uh, uh, is the advertisement web, web injection and also we uh, found one example uh, which uh, provides this provided special access which provided access to the special Facebook applications to victims account but this application was first uh, were, was blocked by Facebook very very quickly uh, the echo name was given by guys from Malwarebytes. You can see their post on the link. So let's go uh, next. Uh, the main distribution methods of these backdoors are uh, video tagging system of Facebook and Facebook direct messages. Uh, when victim uh, gets the link to the special phishing page, which looks like this. Uh, if uh, if victim will try to play the video, the special malicious extension uh, will uh, be installed like the video player actually. So this extension works uh, the same uh, this way. So uh, the first of all, the extension try to load main functionality from command and control server. Uh, in the early versions, command and control server provide, provided main functionality itself. But in the uh, last versions, we saw like uh, we, we saw when uh, the command and control server. Uh, uh, did several redirects to raw GitHub user content, for example, where the extension gets, uh, can get main payload. The main payload uh, was loaded to extension and then it gets the evaluation for inter interaction with Facebook, for getting access to account, for sending spam messages, and so on. Well, uh, the extension, the main extension code, you, you can find 
on the slide. It's partly deobfuscated. Uh, we saw several examples when this piece of code was inserted into big uh, bunch of codes from other extensions, uh, which was loaded from, from GitHub, for example, for masquerade, uh, the main malicious activity. So this code just loads uh, the main activity from server and insert the page. Uh, the main code of bot, uh, of botnet uh, can be founded in uh, Pesman links. Uh, it's loaded by the script, by, by the main script. Yeah, so this one interesting examples, uh, one interesting example, and let's go to another. We called it Smart Browse. Some uh, companies call it Smart Browser. Uh, this is the extension dropper platform, which have several features. So it's a very powerful platform, uh, which uh, installs extensions from zip files. It is the NCS installers, and it is distributed through the uh, Russian partnership programs like Install Monsters, Installs Pro, uh, which distributed uh, which distributed rapid software or potentially unwanted software. In Russia, it's also very popular. Uh, so it has a lot of features. It, uh, it could uh, use special hijacking technology for bypassing uh, Chromium-based browser extensions blacklist. It uses the legal uh, extension IDs uh, when he installing malicious extensions. So the blacklisting mechanism thinks that uh, they using uh, that user uh, use legal extension, but the content is hijacked. Uh, it also could uh, delete ad blockers, competitors from the user systems, and uh, in sometimes it could bypass some browser extension protection mechanism. I will highlight later. In some versions, we found the functionality which allows to switch some Chromium browsers to developer mode or change to battle channel. Uh, some versions uh, set up themselves to the after run. Uh, and uh, this feature uh, uses for, uh, in every system start, changing the extension ideas for uh, bypassing uh, also blacklists. Some extensions block the special Chrome settings pages. Well, the main architecture of Smart Browser you can see on the slide. Uh, the core of this malware is the NC script, uh, which calls the binary libraries uh, when he need to make something something malicious. So, uh, by the, uh, for example, by the alpha Kami DLL, uh, it could patch the preferences and security preferences for Chromium browser to install uh, something malicious. Uh, system DLL provides functionality for WinAP calls. Exec DLL provides functionality for uh, run command line scripts uh, and so on. So the main is the NCs. You can see the code example of this NC script partly deobfuscated on the screen. Uh, the full script also is also provided by the link. Uh, one interesting feature of Smart Browse is adding uh, extensions to the system after run. What is it? The extension uh, for Chromium uh, have special option. Uh, which called background. If extension in its manifest set up this option, uh, it will run uh, even, it will continue run even all browser windows will close it. Uh, the Chromium based browsers have, de have uh, default options uh, stay running in the background mode if any extensions with, with flag is installed. So the Smart Browse installs extension with this flag and also adds Chromium browser with no startup window flag to after run. It allows to start extension after the computer was loaded and keep running it before it switch, switch off. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the user could uh, don't, don't even start his browser, the malicious extension always be running by, by these mechanisms. 
So what's the payload? What's, uh, uh, what's the payload? What's our web injection? Uh, the web injection as a rule, advertisement based. Uh, and sometimes we found something interesting. Uh, for example, this uh, payload hijack the web search systems. When user try to go to the Google, for example, the extension script hijack uh, the request and redirect to another search system. Here is this example for Google, but in full code, you can find that other uh, web search system also use it. Or for example, you can see this code. Uh, this code is the classic uh, web injection for malicious or uh, adware extensions is just insert the script to a web page and this script uh, create a lot of advertisement banners and the content. So this is uh, pretty interesting examples. Of course, they are not uh, hijack the banking content, for example, but the banking content uh, also possible to hijack this way. Nothing differences. So. And uh, very interesting uh, feature that uh, the web injection content also lives in a remote server, so the extension could change its behavior with time. When, like like echo extensions, as we think, when it firstly uploaded to from store, it uh, didn't do any dangerous thing and didn't do any web injection, and it could uh, bypass moderation easily. But after Weeks, for example, it can create the special web injects, and uh, bad things can happen. So that that is very uh, powerful way, very powerful platform for next generation man in the browser attack. Well, we discussed the examples. Let's go to the detection and protection methods. And now I want to give a word to my colleague Evgeny. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrey. Uh, so, uh, let's discuss some detection and protection techniques. And before I start describing detection techniques, I want to highlight some problems, detection problems. So, as Andrew said, malicious functionality can be stored on remote servers. So, uh, this extension, this malicious, uh, malicious extension can change its behavior uh, during its uh, lifetime. So, uh, this is why malicious uh, extensions can uh, just bypass some, uh, um, some moderation processes. And, uh, for example, if you use uh, some, some kind of blacklisting technique, uh, these extensions use popular uh, file hosting services to host payloads, so you can just blacklist these hosting services because uh, your user will be disappointed. And extensions usually uh, use uh, some kind of URL hashing schemes. So uh, they send a hash of the URL to the remote server and remote server response whether uh, what payload should be injected. So even if you have a bunch of such hashes, it's very hard to find out uh, at what uh, sites uh, command and control server will, will inject uh, the payload, uh, will send the command to inject the payload. Uh, as I said, malicious extensions uh, can easily bypass moderation and uh, uh, as I said, uh, as I said, ma malicious, mm, and malicious extension can, uh, for example, act um, the majority of time, like a legitimate extension, but uh, and um, inject malicious payload only if it comes to some to, to a bunch of interesting sites. For example, it's social networks, uh, maybe it's banking applications, and so on. And um, as you uh, as you saw from these examples, uh, there can be few indicators of compromise. Uh, for example, if you take a look at smart browse. Mm, you can see just uh, uh, browser process in Outerun and uh, uh, just just NC script in Outerun and, and that's it. Uh, so uh, let's talk a bit about detection approaches. Uh, you know that there is uh, some kind of traditional AV approach, uh, but uh, you can notice that uh, not only end users are suffering from uh, this managed browser malware, but also web resources are suffering from this mm, uh, f from such kind of malware, so we can involve web resources in the detection of such malicious extensions. Uh, 
So we have the first bunch of detection methods. It's server-side detection methods. And all, all these detection methods are based on the idea of content security policy. So we can use uh, browser reporting opportunities to detect some uh, such web injections or some unwanted content on, um, on web pages. Just uh, in a nutshell, content security policy is a set of headers that can be used to prevent uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Um, but uh, the main, uh, the most interesting part of content security policies for me is that reporting opportunity. You can provide a special URL and uh, you can set up this content security policy. And if this policy is violated, your browser will uh, send a special request to the server that uh, something uh, violates content security policy for this web page. Uh, so, um, content security policy is just a, a header, but it can be defined by, by, a meta, by a special meta tag on your web page, but we don't consider this meta tag to be useful because uh, you can provide reporting URI if you, set, um, if you set up content security policy using a meta tag. Uh, here you can see just an example, uh, this header from server response, it defines uh, content security policy and reporting URI and for example if some kind of uh, uh, script was uh, in, uh, included uh, in the page uh, and this script from evil.example.com, this case will be reported and your server side will, will, will receive uh, this report, uh, this JSON with uh, some, some information about policy, about what directives are violated and so on. So uh, the first detection approach, server-side detection approach, is just to use content security policy. Uh, it can be used by your web application and you can collect these logs, analyze what kind of scripts violate this content security policy and uh, uh, use this information in your de 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 detection engines. Uh, but this uh, approach has a drawback because uh, Malicious extension do have opportunity to remove headers. It can modify content security policy header. It can uh, completely remove it. It can just uh, um, add uh, its uh, its origin to extensions and so on. So uh, to detect such cases, you can use uh, so-called inverse CSP approach. So you just uh, for example, uh, you can use this approach when you need to detect whether uh, your, content your content security policy was uh, header was removed or not. You can add some script on your web page that violates your content security policy and you can expect a report from user's browser and if you don't get this report, then something is wrong with uh, something uh, removed or modified this uh, report URI, for example. And the third approach is so-called GS validation. The same, the same idea like content security policy, but you can just use some kind of, uh, just implement it yourself in JavaScript and embed special JavaScript code onto your web page that will track uh, whether your page was modified, whether its elements uh, well, was modified by external scripts uh, or not, and just send some kind of reports to a web server, but it's, it's not a default feature of browser, you need to implement it itself in JS, but it's not hard to implement. But anyway, we, you can uh, make, it, make it hard to delete. For example, a malicious extension will need to, uh, to do some kind of sophisticated tricks uh, to completely remove this code without breaking down uh, page functionality. And sometimes it, it can be very hard. And we have uh, the second group of detection methods. It's client-side detection methods. Uh, these methods can be implemented in browser. For example, if you're a browser vendor, Yandex has its own browser called Yandex Browser. But if you are developing client-side, uh, if you are developing antivirus solution and you have a client-side antivirus solution, you can implement such kind of methods on client-side. 
Uh, the first obvious method is blacklist. So if you know that this extensions, the, uh, uh, this extension is malicious, you can just add it to blacklist and just remove this extension, or just send notification to user, show notification to user that this extension is malicious and just just remove it. Uh, for example, and uh, the second approach is extensions integrity check. So as Andrew said. Uh, extensions, uh, malicious extensions, sometimes they take uh, IDs from legitimate extensions and just to, to trick uh, some blacklisting mechanisms um, and uh, to bypass some black blacklisting mechanisms. So you can just take this ID, fetch original extension from Chrome store or Opera store and uh, check a hash sum of the extension in the user system and check the hash sum uh, of the extension from this Chrome store or Opera store. And if they don't match that, something is wrong with this extension and it, 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 it's a suspicious case. So we carried out several experiments with such detection uh, detection approaches and uh, we were able to, uh, to to reduce the number of users uh, who are suffering from such man, man in the browser malware. And let's come to the conclusions. So uh, browser-based malware is a, is a new challenge for us because uh, to be honest, not uh, many vendors pay attention to such kind of malware and uh, extension stores uh, should pay more attention to post-moderation period of extension life. Uh, there can be some surprises here. For example, if you, you, you can easily find on the internet uh, the story about how a developer of a uh, popular extension sold his extension to some malware writers and they rolled out an update with malicious functionality. And uh, browser developers should pay more attention to mechanism which Protects you, that protect users from not store extensions. For example, Mozilla Firefox, they um, rolled out an update and now you can just install an extension that's not signed by Mozilla. And AV vendors uh, should also pay attention to such kind of malware and uh, they uh, should struggle against not only an uh, an, uh, drop, uh, an not only against droppers, not only against installers, but also against extensions themselves. Because uh, as you can see, for example, Echo malware, it doesn't have any dropper, it just tricks user to install this extension. And uh, as you can see, content security policy can be a useful thing, not only for protection, protecting your user from uh, cross-site scripting attacks, but also can be used as a detection mechanism because you can uh, collect a lot of logs, you can analyze them on your server side, enrich your detectors, um, employ some kind of statistical approaches and so on, so you can just set it up. It's, it's not hard, uh, this technology is not silver bullet, it has some drawbacks, it can be bypassed sometimes, but anyway, it's good enough at, and uh, it, it tends to be effective against some uh, threats. And that's it, thank you all for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Here is our contact, so you can just drop us an email. Yeah. Feel free to contact us. Thank you. Any questions? Don't be shy. I have just a, a remark. Uh, on Microsoft Edge, now it is possible to have an extension. Yeah. And uh, it's very difficult uh, with uh, on platform Windows 10 to make a loud library because uh, Edge is a protected... Uh, I can answer uh, the Microsoft also, uh, no, as I know from my information, uh, it also has the extension mechanism uh, and uh, the extensions could be written in JavaScript. No, you, you don't need the DLL or browser helper objects. You can create the extension in JavaScript here.
I'm be back. Oh. Uh, from a corporate perspective, uh, would it be best to block all extensions and then whitelist on a per case basis for the, an, an entire organization? Would that be a sufficient way of protecting against these types of malicious extensions? Uh, I I think that uh, it's very uh, hard task to block all extension because, for example, the smart browse uh, this the NCS installer which we discussed uh, could install extension without any user interaction with browser. So user just need to launch the NCS file, and this NCS file will patch the browser, install all extensions, and uh, it could just change some browser options, some browser preferences. So uh, if you, for example, use uh, the group policy mechanism for blocking extension, it can patch the settings, uh, and uh, uh, your protection will fail. I yeah, think. so like patch the local settings, and then just push it, I see, OK. Yeah, so Fair it's enough. very, very hard task to block the extensions. Thank you. Yeah, now I'm here. Thank you very much, Jeff.